It's time once again for Evolve Sales Live. Welcome back. I'm Jonathan Fisher. Software as a service, or SaaS companies, make up one of the most dynamic and fast-growing sectors in all of business today. In 2020, the U.S. SaaS industry was worth an estimated $108.4 billion. This figure is forecast to increase to $225 billion by 2025, an increase of over 100%. With so many new players entering the field, the competition is fierce, and with 92% failing, the casualties are many. Well, if you work for one of those startups, our guest today can help you make sure your company is one of the success stories. Alex Napier-Holland is the founder of Gorilla Flow, a boutique businesses services firm that specializes in creating high-performance sales copy capable of driving revenue on autopilot. His work has launched products and boosted revenue for more than 90 SaaS companies and technology brands, and his clients include businesses of all types and sizes on five continents, including Adobe and Salesforce. In the course of serving his clients, Alex has become very close to dozens of founders, and having seen their struggles firsthand, he brings a great deal of passion to the conversation and is here to help your SaaS brand escape features and benefits trench warfare, beat the odds, and win. Alex, we're excited to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. Well, let's start off a little bit. I think it's interesting how you got into doing what you're doing right now. You specialize, as I mentioned in the intro, in doing powerfully written sales copy for SaaS companies, but you didn't start off as a copywriter. How did you begin into the, you know, get into this industry? Briefly tell our audience. So I come from a sales background. I studied, I graduated in international relations and journalism, and I spent six years in international sales. I started with the Commonwealth Secretariat, so essentially selling um, boutique advertising solutions to predominantly uh, energy companies and ministries based across Africa and Asia. Um, that was where I fell in love with international sales. So understanding how things like culture um, affect the way that people think, the way that people express themselves, and the kind of angling and the approach that you need to sell to them. First of all, to engage with them, to build rapport. Uh, I then moved into international sales for SaaS brands. And I started at a, at a FTSE 100 and ended up leading international sales for, a, for an SME. So after six years of, uh, of closing deals, I then switched to marketing, went from a senior sales position to a junior marketing position and quickly ranked up there. And for the last three years, I've worked as a consultant specializing in uh, SaaS sales copy, specifically home pages and landing pages. So I'm a writer now, but I bring a lot of experience from the actual real world experience of negotiating, pitching and closing deals in both an enterprise and a B2B environment as well, because there's quite a difference between enterprise and B2B, but I don't think it's always appreciated. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not just a difference of scale, but there are some differences in terms of the concern and how to apply certain kinds of principles and, and insights for sure. So yeah. I think it's really important for our audience to understand that, uh, you know, you don't come at this actually as a writer first. That may sound funny, but honestly, that's, that's really important because there's plenty of great writers, but great writing isn't great sales copy necessarily, is it? There's a lot that goes into making sales copy effective. And honestly, just picking your brain on that one topic alone could probably fill up our show. But we're going to keep it focused today. And we've you've noticed a lot of things that are going wrong when it comes to the way that SaaS companies are pitching what they offer. And this is primarily found in terms of the written copy on websites, uh, their email communications, anywhere that language is being used to convey their story. They're making some key mistakes. And uh, you call it trench warfare. Why don't we start right there and have us uh, have you define what do you mean by the features and benefits trench warfare that so many SaaS companies are part of? Yeah, sure. Um, features and benefits trench warfare is, in my view, to lead your business on a costly and an exhausting perpetual arms race to try and defeat your competitors through superior set of features with no compass, mission, or north star, and a constant exposure to better funded development and marketing teams. I can't help but think of a Cold War as an example. I mean, I was an IR student. You look at the, the spending of the USSR in America, the amount that got spent on that, 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 that engagement, how much money got plowed into that. And um, essentially, a lot of SaaS companies are trying to do the same thing as well. They're trying to beat each other just by out-featuring. The problem with this is that, well, there's many problems. The first thing is that it leads you to a very bloated product. So one of the, uh, the last company I ever worked at as a sales executive, um, I 
we had a product that was very comprehensive. It was very capable, but we'd essentially tried to please all of our customers. We had a reactive roadmap. And that's one of the problems here with features mm -hmm. and benefits of French warfare is it leads people to having a reactive roadmap, trying to keep up with all of their competitors. So again, you can't really separate sales copy from product and from development. Um, what you what you end up with is a product that has a lot of capabilities, but the UI and the UX sucks. But that built off of that, the sales copy sucks as well because it's difficult to mm -hmm. you know, everything to everybody. It's difficult to make your product specific to specific to one particular audience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the issue with that is you're you're essentially going to end up plowing a huge amount of money into development, a huge amount of money into marketing. You're fighting fires and you know 360 degrees essentially, as opposed to picking off battles with one or two competitors that are actually a decent match for your product as well. There's just an underlying lack of a north star, a mission. They're unwilling to decide which customers do we not exist for and define that line clearly as well. So it's very difficult to focus any of their marketing efforts or their development efforts in the right place. And they'll end up being mediocre at a lot of different things. And that's true both from the development and from the user experience, but also from the marketing side of things as well. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is that you don't come at this like it's uh, Mad Men. And if you've got the right approach and if your copy is written in such a way and tell such a story, you're still going to sell something that is actually garbage. Uh, yep. You, which, the, um, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the show, but I, I've seen enough snippets to understand that's kind of the, the premise, right? That old school marketing, you could sell almost anything if you're effective as a marketer. You sound like you have a much more of an integrated approach with your clients where the, the product's got to be good, and it has to be attuned in a certain way. And if I could understand what you were saying a moment ago, part of the problem, so let me ask you if you'd agree with this, is that it's their whole a stance, not just from a product development, but also in their marketing, it's too focused on competitors and maybe not enough on end users and, and clients. Is that is that part of the issue? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I love about SaaS, the reason why I've stayed in this sector despite opportunities outside it is – the sense of mission, the amount of products I work with that are actually having a really big positive impact on people's lives. Hmm. And I mean, the most exciting thing in my uh, job is working with founders that really are motivated about having some sort of a human impact. There are some SaaS products that evolve iteratively, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all, but you can't just be slinging mud at a wall and hoping that it sticks. You know, marketing is a two-way process. So on one side of things, it's great to have a particular mission. It's great to be mission focused. But even if you do think you've got a product that could change the world, you've got to listen to your customers. And it would be easy to list off, list, list off um, companies that exist that have pivoted three or four times and ended up doing something very different to their original mission because they listened to their customers, they ran customer feedback, and they responded. And yeah, essentially, there's, there's a balance here. There's this nice balance between being mission focused and also listen to your customers as well. Well, and so getting deeper on that whole subject of mission, you mentioned that that's part and parcel of your process in terms of coming up with a way to really make your clients more successful. Um, how how can we do that? What How does a company begin to grapple with this issue of having a mission? Yeah, I think as I alluded to in my last um question, you, you could roughly divide SaaS companies into two types, very roughly. One is, I mean, I've got a client that I'm working with at the moment. They, they're a physical products company. They've developed a radar system that could potentially reduce road traffic deaths on Earth significantly. So you've got these very mission-oriented companies from the get-go. They have an idea that they think could change the world. You have the other end, which is probably where most of my friends who are founders sit, which is let's play around with a bunch of different ideas and let's see what sticks. And that's a completely valid idea. That's a fun way to approach a business. Hmm. But if you're doing that, you really need to be engaging with your customers. Even the friends I have who are founders, we've now moved away from a um, obviously a waterfall development process to agile. Everybody does some form of agile nowadays. They're looking at getting customer feedback once they've launched their product. What I'm saying is why not do that even before you've launched your product? You know, the pitch that we used to use, which quite a lot of startups use, is before you've even got a beta product, you've got your first framework together. You don't call up and say, hey, I've got a product to sell you. You call up and say, hey, um, I understand you've got this particular problem. Is that correct? Great. I'm building something. or I'm trying to build something that I think could help people like you. I'd love to get your feedback. 
you don't have to give somebody a $20 Amazon gift voucher. You just show a genuine, empathetic, compassionate interest in the problem that they're dealing with. And pretty much anybody, if you sound authentic, will be willing to give up an hour of their time to give you feedback on this problem they have. And you want to sell yourself. And instead of turning up with a basic framework, you've got a buggy beta. And they realize it's actually on its way to being a decent product. Um, one of my friends launched his uh, CRM for charities um, in this manner. And two to three years later, they're on track for a seven-figure valuation because mm. they got it in front of customers before the product even existed. Just because they empathize with and connected with these charities, talked about the pain points they're experiencing. And they could show them their product before they'd even really coded it. Um, it was just a set of screenshots at one point. Well, that sounds like a powerful way to uh, to, to to activate a, a team. Now you actually know there's a market. I mean, little. I mean, if you're needing funding, if I can prove there's already a market because I'm I'm that engaged with an existing marketplace of buyers, that sounds like a very powerful stance to take. Why do you think so many are missing that? Um, there's a variety of reasons. I guess the most cynical answer first: there are some founders that are purely motivated by money. I would honestly say in SaaS, I think that's smaller than any. Any, um, any, any industry that I've dealt with, hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with having a degree of motivation for money, but I think you've got to empathize with your customers. And it doesn't mean that, you know, some people launch products because they've worked with that industry for five or 10 years. They know that audience really well. They really care about that audience. That's fine. But even if it's a brand new product, um, uh, so it's, a, it's an audience you never worked with before, all you have to do is pick up a phone. All you have to do is show a genuine human interest in these people. Uh, I hate to I hate to bring up a Gary Vaynerchuk quote in a marketing, uh, any kind of marketing podcast, but he, he for my sins, uh, Crush It has one or two decent segments in it. And he said, you know, if you're not willing to spend a chunk of your time every single day engaging in the forums, the groups where your audience hang out, don't do this. Go home, do something else. Mm -hmm. If you're a developer, if you're building a product, um, one hour a day, Reddit, wherever they are, just hang out with these people, empathize with them. Um, the most important thing I think that any founder can do, if you've got a two or three first, two or three person company, each of you spend one day a week just picking up a phone and talking to your first customers or talking to people in your industry and just listen to their problems. You'll get so many ideas for A, features, but B, and more importantly in some ways, the angling for features. How, how, what's the human impact of this? Every single B2B SaaS product ever made can save time and save money. So no one cares if you say that. What does saving time and saving money look like for your particular audience? Hmm. And you can pull up examples. Um, I mean, for example, instead of save time, you can say give your support teams their evenings back. Hmm. Instead of save money, you can say hire and scale faster, just like these brands did. Hmm. Instead of measure your performance, you could say build a culture where great work gets celebrated and in each case, drop a quick, quick one-line quote from a customer that fits that particular persona that backs that up as well. Hmm. Great examples. I, lo I love that. Uh, I'm going to come back to the whole thing about some of your, your tips and tricks for copywriters that might be listening as well. So I'll plant that seed and we'll, we'll circle back. So. Okay. So we're we're let's say we're so we're more interacting with our uh, either our audience as it exists now or if we're really radical, <laughs> get out there and find out about them ahead of time. I love that model. Um, what's next? How else do you need to grapple with it? You know, having a mission and make sure you can you know win this whole trench warfare thing that you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I'd essentially break this up into two stages. Um, the first one is winning features and benefits trench warfare, and there's two parts to that. Um, the first is really building customer research into your culture. So the first, the first, <laughs> the first issue is some brands don't do customer research at all. Hmm. And I'd tell them, do it right now. If you need help, hire a copywriter and never, ever hire a copywriter that doesn't talk about strategy and customer research. Any sales copywriter should be talking about those two things. So yeah, do sales copy as a one-time event to get started. In the sense, sorry, do customer research as a um, as a one time event, and um, that can be done in two ways. Um, one is to do customer surveys, which are great for scale. So, sending out a Google form asking people, for example, how did you discover our product? Why did you choose us over our competitors? What's the business impact of our product? And crucially, how does it feel to have our product in your life? 
hmm. both sorts of questions, open-ended questions. Because even in B2B sales, yes, there are certain things like, yes, this product achieves compliance with GDPR, this product can achieve compliance with these particular financial reporting regulations. But there's always a human being at the other end that wants to understand how it will make their life better in some way. The thing with B2B that defines it against B2C is it's multi-stakeholder. So we have to do this for you know someone in accounting, somebody in C-suite. We have to do it for the end user. The second um, way that we do customer research is using uh, interviews. So I use interviews more for depth. So I might do a customer survey to 200, 250 customers. And then I might do interviews for 10 customers potentially. And I pull those quotes in. I organize them into each stage of a purchase journey from a customer evaluating your product through to choosing it, through to using it. That gives us a lot of intel then for our marketing activities. But the second thing I'd say there is once you've done it as a one-time event, you want to be building customer research into your, into your business on an ongoing basis. Hmm. One thing that really worries me is when you look at Agile as a... Um, you look at Agile as a concept, as a development process, this stuff should happen in Agile. So mm -hmm. what worries me is when marketers aren't doing customer research, there's one of two possibilities here. One is that um, development's doing product research and marketing don't know about it. Well, that's mm -hmm. bad because they're siloed, mm -hmm. but that's easy to fix. The bigger problem here, the really real worry is that product development aren't doing customer research. No one is doing customer research. And people are building features that haven't been put in front of customers. That's terrible. Mm. You're not doing agile properly if you're not doing customer research. So that leads me on to my second point, which is that um, customer research shouldn't just be about marketing. This is about unifying and unsiloing marketing, customer support, development, sales. The interesting and ironic thing is that I find big companies are worse at this. Hmm. Big companies often are so heavily funded, they disappear under a mountain of marketing metrics. They can talk about clicks and engagement, and maybe marketing qualified leads on a good day. But you ask them, how much revenue have you actually generated from each campaign? And they can't do that. I, I could name a lot of smaller companies that are much better at telling you how much money their campaigns are generated. Um, so yeah, I think I think buying into customer research and customer engagement as an ongoing business-wide process that should unify every department in your, co in your company is huge. Um, and if you do all of these things, you're going to end up with not just features and benefits oriented copy, but features and benefits oriented copy that is relatable and humanistic. I can give a case study here. Um, there is a real estate SaaS brand I work with in North America in Canada, the biggest in, in North America as it stands, they have a um, an application that before their product came in, they had four or five different desktop apps that were badly integrated and clunky, uh, various horrible APIs. And their sales reps would be working all weekend a lot of the time. And two different sales reps said something like, before I use this product, I would often miss out on weekends. I would end up upsetting my wife and my kids. Now I have his app. I can leave work on Friday early and go camping with the kids and check my mobile app twice. So we're not selling a business benefit here. We're not talking about KPIs or ROI. We're telling somebody we can give you a weekend's back. That blows any business benefit out of the water. When you can take a business product and start talking to people about feelings and emotions and family time and making their life better in a very human and relatable way, you're doing great. But... There's a second step to this. This is all to do with winning features and benefits trench warfare. The next level is escaping features and benefits trench warfare. And we do that with positioning. So that's saying who is our what who is our company? Who is our brand? Who is our business? What is our brand? Who do we stand for? Who are the customers that we serve? So when somebody lands on your page, just from the headline and the explainer alone, if we get it really right, they think that's me. This company exists just for me and for people like me. So yeah, I'd say always start with the customer research. Use that to develop more humanistic and relatable features and benefits. But the more that you do that, start asking yourself, what's the common thread here? What is the relatable human impact that our business is having? What are we doing to people's lives? And if you haven't already got a mission yet, can you develop a mission 
because you can go out into the world of your own mission, but you can equally get a mission given to you when your customers keep telling you because you're talking to them and you're listening to them. Your customers are telling you, this is what you did to us. This is what you did to our lives. You can define your own mission based on that as well by finding out how your products impacted them. Well, that's very powerful stuff. And that kind of, that again, that level of interaction requires a real commitment on the part of the founders and the, the leadership. Uh, I also like what you said about being siloed and have these separate departments. And that does certainly seem to be a common feature among some of the larger players. Now, in some of our private conversation, you mentioned to me that there are other advantages that some smaller players may have over their big behemoth, well-known name brand competitors. Uh, what are some of those as well? Like if we're comparing marketing departments, for example, what, why could it be an advantage to be smaller? I think one of the, the biggest, and again, I reference point here, most of my friends are founders rather than developers. Um, a lot of my friends are in the, the maker scene, Bali and Thailand, a lot of those guys running their own businesses. Agility, they're ridiculously agile. If you're a one-person band, a one-man band, or if you're a ten-person business or a fifteen-person um, size business, and you speak to your customers, you speak to a number of different customers, and essentially do what I did when I was leading sales for a an SME with only 15, 20 people, I would come back into the office and I'd say, right, uh, I've just spoken to the third customer in the last two months that wants this particular feature that we're not developing until two years from now. Hmm. Can I please have a sit down? Let's talk to development. And the key thing here for sales guys, and I, I, this should not need to be told, but you never promise features in a meeting. I mean, that's basic. I always say, okay, I understand this is a product that you'd like. Let me go and speak to the guys in development. We'd sit down and we'd look at the product roadmap and think, you know, how much revenue is tied to each of these features? And I'll tell them there's three different companies here. There's a 200 grand on the line. If we could get this particular feature in, you know, before the end of the year. And a smaller company's got that ability to A, break the silo, have everybody sitting around one table. I'm not going to drop in the Jeff Bezos quote about two pizzas in one room, but we all know it. You can get everybody in the same room. You can talk, you can hash things out, and you can switch the product roadmap around. That's both because the company's smaller, but also culturally as well. I think agility is more of a, it's a cultural thing as well. The, the not getting too tied into a single way of doing things or a fixed set of ideas, being willing to challenge what it is that your business does um, and, and how it operates. So yeah, I think agility is the main thing that smaller companies have going for them. Well, yeah. And uh, one of our guests uh, put a comment here that small and medium enterprises rock. They take take to action, take action 10 times faster. Yep. And uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think you're right on the money there. And that's all what's all about, especially when the market is, is in such a growth mode. I mean, a curve of doubling <laughs> within yeah. the next three years. Uh, that's that's pretty amazing. So um, let me let me circle back then. So what else can can uh, can the smaller players do? And maybe you could include in that, you know, you kind of have a freer hand. I, I've noticed this as well in a smaller company in areas like your marketing creativity and developing a voice in marketing where some of the bigger corporate brands, they seem a little bit, a little bit more, I don't know what the right word is, but it almost seems like they're scared, like they're going to mess that up. And you get this more stodgy, conservative approach. And I think that liberality being able to play a little bit in this space really speaks to the whole range of marketing efforts, but especially copywriting. Speak to that a little bit. Would you, our, our audience members, I'm certain, includes people that are involved in copywriting. Uh, what are some additional insights, tips you could give as one of the better practitioners in the art yourself? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I mentioned earlier was simply picking up a phone daily, talk, trying to talk to your customers. Um, I think, though, as well, being more playful, having more fun, and being willing to... Um, poke a little bit of fun at bad and outdated ideas, um, poking a bit of fun at maybe maybe even some of the people you don't want to work with. A, a good example here recently that I spotted that I liked was Toggle. I reckon most people uh, following, this, uh, following this conversation have used Toggle, time tracking app. I use it. They have a page the other day that basically said, do you want to spy on, on your employees? We're not for you. We don't, we don't develop features for... Um, for managers who want to spy on their employees. We don't believe in that. We believe that people should be free to focus on productive work output. So I think defining, you know, who's our club, who's our little group, who's our gang. And if there is, 
if you can grow your business into new verticals, that's great. But there might be certain groups out there where they have incompatible ideas. I mean, one particularly contentious discussion is around remote work, for example. A lot of SaaS brands are taking remote work as an opportunity to pitch their tent. We support remote work. We support teams and businesses that are remote. And we're openly going to make fun of people and businesses that won't go remote as well. So being willing to be a little bit provocative, obviously, while being respectful, you can be a bit cheeky. But yeah, poking fun at outdated ideas. I mean, I'm very bullish on remote work. I love remote work. It's had a big impact on my life. And I'll poke fun at people who are trying to get everybody back into the office again. Hmm. I mean, I've got clients of mine who disagree with me on that, but that's fine. We like each other. We can be respectful around it. But I think having a bit of a sense of humor as well. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty helpful. So having a sense of humor could be seriously helpful is what you're trying to say. Yeah, it's just doing it in a way that's uh, that's tactful and and pitching yourself Mm -hmm. to look at the idea. What are the bigger ideas of at the moment that are defining society? So obviously out of COVID, we've got the remote work, hybrid work, um, return to the office conversation and debate. And yeah, that's a lot of SaaS brands have been pitching their tentpole. Where do we sit in this particular divide? Because that's a way to show customers who you are, what your mission is, and what your values are. And somebody who's very bullish in remote work will say, you know what, these two products look very similar, but this particular one, they share our values, they share our mission, they want to be for remote brands, for example. And mm. we're gonna work, we're gonna work with those guys because I think part of having a mission as well is thinking, what does the future look like? What do I think the future will look like? And where does my business sit within that future as well? Mm. It's, it's a bit of a gamble in that as well. And that's a good opportunity for storytelling as well. Excellent. Well, it's been a great conversation already, Alex. We're going to move over to Q&A here in just a minute. But Alex, you've uh, extended a really gracious offer to all of our audience members today. Uh, Why don't you share with our listeners what they can do to go further with what you've got to offer in terms of successful copywriting? Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, If anybody would like to get a 50-minute breakdown or teardown of their homepage or landing page, I'll record a loom for you and point out any, um, any, any, any uh, customer experience or particular copy, um, copy factors of your, of your homepage, your landing page. It could be improved. I think the, the sales copy could be improved, the layout, the design, anything that I think could potentially help boost your conversions. Feel free to visit me at gorillaflow.com and just uh, use a contact form and just mention you'd like to get a free 15-minute um, landing page or homepage breakdown. I'll be happy to get that recorded and sent over to you within seven days. No obligation at all. If it's helpful, that's great. If you wanted to talk to me about anything after that regarding working on it, uh, that's that's fine as well. But yeah, no strings. Oh, that's awesome. Really appreciate that. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to get to Q&A in one moment, but uh, not before we remind everybody that our show, as always, is sponsored by Overpass.com. Need to build a team of remote sales professionals fast? As the leading solution for finding and hiring pre-vetted talent, Overpass makes building a high-quality team fast and easy. With thousands of qualified candidates to choose from, you can filter by industry and experience at lightning speed. Interview and hire in as little as two days. Create your free account today at overpass.com. All right, well, let's get into some Q&A. We've got some questions coming in from our audience, and folks, keep them coming. Uh, so um, this is an interesting uh, question from Andrew uh, Ellenberg. He's, he's asked this, what role does storytelling play in business communications? That's something that we didn't really unpack much, if at all, in the show. Tell us about that, if you would, Alex. That's a great question, actually. Um, <clears throat> this is something I've yeah thought about quite a bit. Um, I am slightly... I wouldn't say I'm bearish or skeptical of storytelling. I think it's done badly a lot of the time. I think the storytelling works when you make it about your customer. Storytelling doesn't work when you make it exclusively about you. If you can tell your story, it might be ostensibly about you, but you relate it back to your audience, then it can work. So yeah, I think storytelling can work well within a within a SaaS brand's website, particularly on the if you go to an about page. Um, Shout out to a, another copywriter, uh, Joel Kletke. is a very good copywriter that I'm friends with. He's talked about about pages quite a bit. He's got some good content on that if you stick it, stick his name to Google. Hmm. Um, 
essentially using an about page that could previously be used for just telling a story that brags about your brand or brags about your accomplishments, but instead using that to build relatability. So I think storytelling can be a really powerful tool, but just always think about how does this benefit or relate to my audience? Even if it's about your life, about the reasons why you started a business, about the reasons why you built a product, that's great. Just always think about how that can help them, why your audience might care, how it might help them buy into your, your mission, your values. Um, so yeah, storytelling can definitely build empathy, but if it's done in a, in a two-way manner. I've got a follow-up question of my own all along that line. Do you think that the storytelling is best done in first person? Is it done more corporately? Um, how playful should that be? Like, is, is, there, is the whole range good, or are you finding certain things work better than others? I mean, it depends on the size of the business. I mean, I guess it would be a given if you're a solo maker, it's going to be the first person. If you're a much larger company, it's inevitably going to be third person. In between, there's a little bit of a gradient there. Um, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the size of the company. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule there. Um, what was the second you, you asked about humor, didn't you? Yeah, like so. So you could tell the story in, in itself. That comes back to the whole question of using humor. Just lost you there, Jonathan. Um, I mean, I guess there, I could see some risks there. You know, it, that can seem trite. Um, it could seem like it's not as effective, depending. So I'm wondering how that would uh, how that would impact. Oh, okay. So it looks like we had an issue. Now, um, I'll, I'll uh, fill in a little bit here. We've got a couple of the questions we'd like to get some answers to. And Alex is in true digital nomad form. He hails from London, uh, London, England, in, in case you would never guess that from his accent. Uh, but he's not in London right now. He's in a, a, a far eastern location, and there must have been an issue there with uh, internet. Hopefully he'll be able to jump back in. And uh, in the meantime, I did notice that there were some interesting questions here from the audience uh, about like how important the user interface is based on some of that feedback um, and how much how much the actual features and benefits play against the outcomes in terms of our marketing and messaging, maybe going deeper on that as well. Uh, I'm going to give Alex about another minute or so to get, get back with us here. And if he's not able to jump back on, what I will do, folks, is we will uh, – I'll get those answers to your questions myself. And Here it comes. Okay. I'm not sure which one of us that was. Here we are. Well, we're I, I threw you under the bus, man. It's you. <laughs> yeah, but it's okay. It, it's uh, that's okay. It's uh, it's technology. We love it when it works, right? So, uh, yeah. With no, with, without any further hindrance, I'll just uh, mention the other question that I, I that stood out to me here uh, from Andrew is he was wondering how much does you uh, UI play in? And I'm sorry, it wasn't from Andrew. That was from Dennis. Was wondering because he uh, he resonated with the idea of doing the customer interviews. Uh, the company where Dennis works, here's his question. And he was wondering, does user interface, you know, really play a big role when it comes to the, the you know, market competitiveness? Is that, in other words, what I'm seeing, Dennis, you can correct me in the chat. What I'm hearing in your question is, if it's not about a features and benefits trench warfare, how much does just user experience help us in that particular battle? Maybe that's what he's getting at. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would. Or interface, rather. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got more, I've worked with a number of UX consultants, more than, more than UI in particular. Um, I think it depends on the maturity of a product. I think that if you're, you know, if, you, if you're just about to launch a product, far less so. Um, if you are, yeah, I think the more mature a product is, the more, uh, the more important your user experience um, is going to become. Absolutely. Um, you know, you're a, if you're calling up customers who are highly engaged, who are have have a very strong level of um, what we call. The two main factors in sales copywriting are um, problem awareness and solution awareness. They really dictate how people engage with your copy. Someone who has a high level of problem awareness and a high level of solution awareness, they're very likely to use your product. They'll use and enjoy your product when it's buggy, when the user experience isn't refined. As your product becomes more mature and you've picked up and cleared out most of the people who have that strong high level of problem and solution awareness you're trying to get more customers on board at that point who necessarily aren't super pumped about it who are slightly more cautious and um, that's when stuff like optimizations for user experience become more valuable i think okay. you get your low-hanging fruit early on people who are going to be really early movers i mean i think part of it's about how much they want your product but also the kind of culture mm -hmm. so small businesses are often more willing to use 
products that aren't necessarily polished because they love the brand, they love the mission. If you want to sell to B2B, but especially enterprise, I mean, enterprise is a complete nightmare that I don't think most people actually want to deal with in terms of SLAs. But you're trying to do B2B sales, for example. You get more and more um, RFQs, for example, having to fill out spreadsheets explaining how your product works, how well it works. And um, I think poor user experience is, is likely to sink you more the more mature that you get, the more that you're selling to larger organizations. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and so I think the logical follow on to that, I'm, I'm starting to think in terms of like a, a phased rollout, right? So if we if yeah. we took the model that you seem to be positing as an ideal model, we've already done our research before we even have the first developers yeah. starting work. So we have it uh, kind of at least it's it's on a whiteboard somewhere or it's wireframed out somewhere. And then we begin, we begin developing iteration one, and that's because we're in close touch with our users. We know what features yeah. and benefits they're going to definitely want. But the UI may not be the first priority. We want to make sure the thing works well and yep. doesn't have downtime, doesn't is not glitchy, right? Then, so that's like phase two in a way, really. Phase one was the research. Phase two is the first build, iteration one. Then in a phase three, if I'm hearing what you just said, now you, you're saying that is worth taking a look now. All right, is the user interface where it's spot on needs to be? And maybe I'm just, I'll ask the question. I can guess the answer. Maybe that's a whole different round of then research with your users at that point. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, there's the, the the famous quote. And again, most of my friends are developers. So a lot of what I do is just cross seed information between the two. If you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you launch too late. I like that a lot. It should, ha- <laughs> it should have bits of cardboard and strings and wires hanging off it. Um, because I mean, obviously, it's better to have a polished product. The point mm-hmm. is that you want to be getting in front of people when it's barely working simply because you can create a more relevant product. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I would absolutely... I thought you were going to mention polishing a product in the second phase, and I'm glad you didn't because that would very much be third at the very least. Your first is just getting it in front of people, getting your first customers by any means possible so you can afford to eat. Yeah. From there, it's about getting enough features into the product so that it can perform the things they need it to do. And at that stage, I mean, the sales pitch we used to use was – if you join our join our if our product right now, sorry, if you join our SaaS right now, if you start using our product, you have a unique opportunity to shape the future of our product, which is a great way of saying it's half built. Please buy it now before we finish <laughs> making it. Um, right. Don't mind and, the cardboard and duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just step over those boxes over there in the corner. But that, that's one way to frame it, basically, is you've got this unique opportunity to develop our product that people won't have later. And yeah, UI is very important and I'm very bullish on user experience in general. I like polished products. I'm a kind of person, I love dark mode. I love having the little app icon that I can switch to a black version of that app icon because I like everything to be monochrome. Yeah. Um, that, that's me as a as an end user. But as a marketer, I know that if, you know, again, people say if you're adding dark mode before you've got customers, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You know, you if people, the, True. the most passionate people that you've really honed in on and you've got your product really addressing their needs, they won't care if it's polished. They won't care if it's got dark mode. But as your product expands and you are trying to sell it to bigger and large professional organizations, yeah, there are certain features you will need and UI optimizations will have to be made too, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Love it. Well, and and I think that the there, there's an appeal in being a part of that 10% early adopter cohort, right? The, I, the, like... Those those of us who are part of that group that, that yeah we get we got we get to be part of building the whole thing that, that all for certain good. people pay, pay for, for the certain people. certain people right yeah definitely for certain people I mean if you were trying to pitch a hospital for example and it's a software they're using to run their life support machines probably not um, but uh, but yeah I mean absolutely particularly creative tools if you're selling a creative tool for example uh, something like Figma I'm sure they probably had some extremely passionate early users where the product working isn't necessarily life and death. It's just something fun and relatable. Yeah. And it works well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great stuff. Well, we, we could probably continue on even longer, but Alex, you've been gracious with your time and we're grateful to have you with us today. Uh, I could see having you back down the road. Thanks so much for being with us on our show today. A reminder to everybody who is with us. Don't forget we're here every single week at the same time, same station. And uh, next week, we're going to have a topic about how to better manage your remote sales team, especially in a social selling world. We've had a a lot of conversation uh, in recent show episodes about how to handle the social selling, but there's this missing piece of 
how do you do it when you've got these remote workers that are all around the globe? Uh, they may be fractionally margin, uh, 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 managed. How can you actually implement uh, in the social selling space? We've got a fantastic expert on that topic coming next week, Nick Capozzi, for his second visit. So don't miss it. All right. Well, once again, Alex, thanks a lot. Uh, someone said Dr. Freeze got you earlier. Good line. That's that. Good, that's the dad joke of the episode. So thanks, Dennis. I know you're a dad, even if I didn't know you were a dad. Now I do know it. And uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, for the whole crew here, Alex, audience, thanks for being here. That's going to do it for us. Have a great rest of your weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. 